So glory to God, even in COVID, God is working. And uh, we have um, just a wonderful time. The missionaries bonded together as family, and I believe they're excellent missionaries. We have a, a missionary couple going to Quebec. We have another that will be church planting in the Windsor area. Another couple up in uh, Oshawa. And then one young lady who happens to be my daughter going into biblical translation. That will be her ministry. She's currently down in Milford, Ohio, taking her master's degree in biblical translation. And she's just been approved as a BMFP missionary. So pray for Renee. Uh, I believe she's going to do a good job. She's got a good heart uh, for that. Then also, if you could pray for our family personally, my father, who just celebrated his 85th birthday, has really been suffering since Christmas time. He's been in the advanced stages of his Parkinson's disease. And basically the last three months, he's been completely bedridden, responding less and less, not able to do anything for himself. And uh, he really had uh, a turn downwards about two or three weeks ago, and he's been hospitalized. He's been in palliative care. And we actually expect uh, dad to go home and be with the Lord very soon. It, it could be today. It, it could be any hour, any moment. And so would you pray for, for us? Pray for a peaceful passing for my dad. He's ready to go. And just pray for my mom, as this will be, you know, a, a totally different experience for her after being married for 62 years. Um, it won't be easy for mom. We'll be here to support her, but just pray that God will sustain, uh, sustain her as well. I really, really appreciate that. So our text today is in the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 1. And uh, I'd really like to tie it in a little bit with what I shared about my dad. You know, my dad is not a perfect man, but my dad loved the Lord. And after 85 years, I can look back at my dad's life and say he, he built it on a sure foundation. And it has to do with the gospel. And in Luke chapter 1, the first four verses, the gospel writer Luke talks about things that are most surely believed. Things most surely believed. That's the title of our message today. And I want to talk about the certainty of gospel truth and how that applies not only in building your life on the foundation of, of salvation as it's revealed in the gospel and making certain that you're saved. But once you're saved, to build your life day by day uh, with the certainty that those things are true, and it makes a real difference, I believe, for every one of us today to understand, to know it, and to live by it. So, if you have your Bibles open then, Luke chapter 1, uh, let's go ahead and read just the first four verses. The Bible says, For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. Again, notice in verse number one, that phrase, the, those things which are most surely believed among us. And then in verse four, that thou might 
Midas know the certainty of those things, things surely believed and the certainty of those things. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and then we'll dive right in. And I trust this will be a blessing to you this morning. Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunity to gather together, uh, Lord, even by electronic means today. Uh, Lord, we know that um, your word is powerful. It's uh, alive. It's sharp like a two-edged sword. And uh, Lord, it cuts right to the very critical matter uh, that we're dealing with today in our lives. Father, <clears throat> my family and I are dealing with the imminent passing of a patriarch in our family. But Lord, every, every heart of every listener, every family, every individual is dealing with issues in their life today too. Every one of our listeners, every one of the viewers here today. And Father, if we are not building our lives on a sure foundation, uh, then we really have nothing to live for. Father, we uh, don't have the confidence that will carry us through this life and on into the next. So Lord, we ask and we pray uh, that you'll bless our time together in your word now in Jesus' name. Amen. The gospel writer is Luke. The gospel writer is Luke, who's an intriguing figure because he's the only, from what we understand, the only Gentile gospel writer. Matthew, Mark, and John are all Jewish, but Luke was a physician and a companion of Paul's during his missionary journeys. And he, of course, wrote the book of Acts, which reveals him to be uh, a great historian, uh, a geographer, one who kept meticulous records of details. Uh, that's just like a doctor, isn't it? Uh, his writing style conveys that me meticulous, but yet very personal at the same time, I think reflecting uh, the vocation of a good doctor, at least the way uh, doctors used to be, the old uh, traditional family doctor, you know, that paid house visits and knew his patients very well, took a personal interest in them. When I was a kid growing up, we had a doctor, uh, Dr. Woods, John Woods, and uh, deep voice, big man, you know, a little imposing to a young boy sitting across from <laughs> from him at the at the doctor's desk. But uh, he was a chain smoker as well. I don't know how that went together with being a doctor. But anyway, he was a great doctor. And many years later, after I was grown and married, had a couple of kids, I met him in the shopping mall, at an old Eaton's department store. And I recognized him right away. Of course, he wouldn't have recognized me, but I went over, introduced myself. And he said, Brian, how are you? How's your mom and dad? How's your grandparents? How are your sisters and your brother? And he named every one of them by name. Now, that's an old time family doctor. And uh, I'll never uh, forget the interest that he took and the care that he provided for our family. And I imagine Luke to be the same sort of a warm individual who was interested in the people he served. And the personal style that's employed by Luke gives us more of a glimpse into the human side of Jesus' life than in any other gospel. You know, Jesus was 100% God, and he was 100% man. Uh, the, the God man, the perfect God man. And so Luke reveals that to us. The purpose of Luke's gospel is set forth in these few, first few verses that we've read today. And that's our text and our topic. Now, we believe the Bible to be the sole 
authority in all matters of faith and practice. So in other words, biblical preaching, our own personal study of the Word of God should affect not only our belief system, but it should impact our conduct and the way that we lived. And when the message is aimed at growing our faith, the corresponding growth in our conduct will also take place. So in other words, the more I learn about who God is, the better able I am to live this Christian life. The more I learn about the doctrine of salvation, the more I can appreciate that the more that that should give me an interest in sharing that message with, with others who are lost. The more that I understand about the holiness of God, the more that I ought to desire to live the sanctified life. So you get, get the idea. Now, the central and dominating factor in any person's life are their core beliefs. The Bible says in Proverbs 23, 7, as, he th as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You know, you look at the nonsense that's going on in the world today, the way people are acting, the way people are behaving or misbehaving themselves. There is a direct link back to whatever their core beliefs are. And if God's not a part of that, you can expect chaos. But when God is central and his word is a priority then you expect order to come out of that civility everything that's proper everything that's good everything that's right and so my question is today what are you building your life on what are the things that you surely believe what are the things that you count to be a certainty i hope it begins with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm talking about his glorious person, his finished work on Calvary's cross. And as we look at our text today, we're going to notice some compelling qualities in that gospel truth. These qualities should drive home that assurance in each of our lives. And so I want to begin with this thought about the corroborating witness to gospel truth. In other words, you have four Gospels. Those four Gospels harmonize perfectly one with the other. They dovetail together so that we what we have are not four conflicting records of Jesus' life and ministry. We have four perfectly harmonious records. Yes, they're different. They're as different as the personalities of the men, that God used to pen those Gospels. But Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John convey a different perspective of the life and ministry of our Savior. And yet, when placed together, they give us a full picture and one that doesn't contradict in any way, shape, or, or form. Uh, Matthew was written primarily to the Jews and portrays Jesus as the Messiah. Mark describes him, uh, Jesus Christ, as a man of decisive action. Mark is the most concise of all the Gospels and presents Jesus as the servant Savior. Uh, of course, John wrote his Gospel for a wide audience and described Jesus as the eternal Word who participated with God in the creation of the universe. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And so we uh, are revealed to us miracles in John's Gospel. Uh, they are signs that identify Jesus as the divine Savior. The uh, deity of Jesus Christ is front and center in the Gospel of John. And then we come to Luke the Gentile physician, who wanted other Gentiles to realize through his gospel that Jesus is the universal Savior. Now, there's not a, there's not a universal salvation. In other words, not everyone is saved, but there's a universal Savior, and salvation is available to all who would believe. 
And in our gospel, we find a unique connection with uh, J Jesus Christ, with the poor and the outcast of society, the common men and women. And Jesus is portrayed as the Son of Man. And so in our text, Luke says, For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things. Luke says there's multiple accounts. Mine's not the only one. I'm not attempting to do something entirely uh, or original, but yet um, there is an undertaking involved. And uh, I'm going to be part of that. And of course, his participation in that, excuse me, I've just got to mute this phone. I've got something that just uh, notifications keep wanting to go off. Excuse me for just a half a second. And um, we are going to make sure that we turn these notifications off. Okay, again, my apologies for that. All right, so this undertaking, not only of Luke's, but of the other three writers, is a colossal undertaking. How do you begin to uh, write a biography of the life and work of Jesus Christ? I mean, that's massive. John himself said at the end of his gospel, John 21, verse 25, he said, there are also many other things. He said, I, I can't write at all. Many other things which Jesus did, the which if they were written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. So in human terms, we're talking about something that's impossible. It's not only unlikely, it's really undoable, unimaginable, and it's not possible without the uh, involvement of the Holy Spirit of God, right? These men who pen the scriptures were inspired, the Bible says, by the Spirit of God. Second Peter 1.21 says, The prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but the holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. It's a colossal undertaking, and it's a credible one, right? They These are men gospel writers, look at verse number two, it says, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. You have men that are eminently qualified to write the gospel records because they were eyewitnesses. They walked and talked with Jesus. They saw firsthand his miracles. They heard his teaching. They were with him for those three and a half years, and they also were ministers of the word. Now, Luke, being a Gentile, uh, he familiarized himself not only uh, with the writers of the other gospels, but through the apostle Paul and his travels with Paul, he came to what he describes in verse 3 as having had perfect understanding of these things from the very first. So these men who give us the gospels, under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, were men that were well-equipped for the task. It was a credible undertaking, and it was a complimentary one. So they worked together, uh, and yet independently of one another, and through the Holy Spirit, uh, came up with not a conspired uh, gospel account, but one that corroborated itself perfectly. Luke says, I know there's other gospels been written, but it's, he says, it seemed good to me also, verse 3. So he's not attempting to duplicate or replace the work of the other gospel records. Uh, rather, he's impressed by the Holy Spirit to pen yet another perspective. And thank God we have the four gospels. What a beautiful story. You listen. You will never grow old of reading the gospel accounts. Read them and read them and read them again. Tell me the story. Tell me the old, old story. I, I never get tired of hearing the story of Jesus. Do you? So this is 
the corroborating witness. If, if you want proof that the gospel is real, read these historical accounts, and you can be left with no other conclusion, but this is an accurate historical uh, accounting of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ and the salvation that he came to bring. But we also notice a careful arrangement in gospel truth. Verse 1, Luke said that he, he had, his attempt was to set forth in order a declaration. In other words, there's an arrangement here. There's a composition. Um, there's a sensible arrangement of these truths. You know, it's a joy to uh, attend any event or experience um, a, a production where careful thought has been put, whether it's a symphony or whether you're reading a, a novel or you're watching a movie where you say, well, you know what, this all makes sense. It all goes together um, so well. And gospel truth involves a proper arrangement in which there's continuity, there's sequence, progression, and, and, and flow to it. The Bible has a chronological as well as a doctrinal progression. You begin reading in the book of Genesis, and you follow the chronology of the biblical story, but it's not only straight chronology, as um, we'd read a timeline, but there's also a weaving together of redemption truths from the first sinners, Adam and Eve, and the fall of man uh, through the, the first uh, indication that there would need to be a blood sacrifice in order for sins to be atoned. Uh, all the way through the days of Moses and the, the tabernacle and the establishment of ceremonial worship in Israel, uh, and you know the Passover lambs that were slain, and then the day-to-day uh, -day functions of the, the priest and the high priest, the Day of Atonement, how all that's woven together and all pointing towards the sinless sacrifice of Jesus Christ. There's wonderful continuity to it. And, you know, Bible truth is precept upon precept. That's what it is, line upon line. Here a little, there a little, Isaiah said. That's why we need to be in God's Word every day. That's why we're always learning uh, something new. The basic truths of the gospel never change, but we're building on that in our understanding, and it's strengthening us, and it's encouraging us, and it's helping us to move forward. We just keep going in the Christian life, putting one foot in front of another. Never take your hands off the wheel, as it were. Never um, never take your foot off the gas. You're moving forward. You're going, uh, you're, you're walking, we're walking lockstep together. You know, the thing is about you and I as Christians and you and I as church members, not everyone is in this, the same place place as far as their maturity and their growth in Christ, but we're all going the same direction. At least I hope we are today. We're wanting to be more like Jesus. And so there's that natural progression in our lives, and the gospel brings that out. Look at how the disciples grew and had to grow, and Jesus taught them. And as we read the gospels, we're going to grow as well. There's a consistency in these uh, gospels. There's a harmony. Consistency has to do with how a thing holds together, right? Uh, nobody likes their soup watery. You like it a little thicker. Uh, I like, uh, I used to like Campbell's chunky soup because it had thickness to it. There, there was substance in there and the, the soup uh, held together. And the consistency of the gospel message is how they hold together. No contradictions. Everything just perfectly meshes and uh, strengthens the surrounding passages. There's a, there's a context to everything. Second Peter 1.20 says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. In other words, the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. 
We don't just lift verses or passages out of their context. Everything fits together. And if there's a verse you come across that seems hard to understand, don't guess at the interpretation of that verse. Dig a little further. And you're going to find that Jesus, for instance, many times reference Old Testament passages. Well, if you go look those up, that will help you to understand the context of what Jesus is speaking about. Paul quoted dozens and dozens of Old Testament passages. And all of that put together makes one consistent message. Then there's the correctness of it. In other words, it's proper, it's appropriate. It's the facts, it's the truth. In life, there is truth or there is no truth. We live in the day where people are saying, well, this is my truth. Well, listen, uh, I hate to break it to you if you're saying, well, I have my truth. You don't get to have your own truth. There's the truth. <laughs> you know, there, there's the truth in the physical laws that govern our universe. There's the truth of the law of gravity. And you could stand out off of a 10th floor balcony and say, I, I'm going to defy that law because I'm embracing my own truth. And you know what? You, you leap from that balcony and the truth is going to kill you because you said, well, I had my truth, which turned out to be no truth at all, but actually destroyed your life. The truth is the truth. And if any composition, let's say, violates the governing principles of uh, that discipline, it's no longer correct or right. So in music, you don't end up with symphony, you end up with a cacophony. In art, you don't end up with a masterpiece, but a monstrosity. In mathematics, uh, you end up, you know, like let's say math applied to architects, architecture. You don't end up with a building that uh, will stand. You end up with a building that falls apart. Um, it just it's not going to work is what I'm saying. There's the truth. And the gospel is the truth that will support your life and mine. Then we've noticed the cor corroboration uh, of the gospel record or corroborating witnesses in the four gospels. We have noticed its careful arrangement. And I want you to see next the commitment to exposition of gospel truth. That's where Luke says uh, that he uh, wanted to put forth a declaration, a declaration, verse one, set forth in order a declaration of those things. Uh, th this is what's really important, that the gospel be declared true to the history of the Bible, true to the meaning. There's many applications of scripture but there's only one interpretation. And we used to sing in Sunday school a little song that says three questions. As I read God's word each day, I will ask myself three questions. What does it say? What does it mean? And what is God saying to me? And we want to make sure that as we declare God's word, that we're taking to heart not only what God has said, but the meaning of what God said and what does it say to me and help people understand that as they read the word of God, there's one interpretation of it. There's one meaning. This is what it says. This is what it means. But allow for the fact that God is going to speak to the individual's heart in a very unique individual and personal way. And not only should we approach God's word like that each day, I hope you do. Every time that there's a sermon, every time uh, that you open the Bible for personal devotions or family devotions, to think, boy, you know what? God has a word for me today. God has something that's going to impact my life. God has something to say 
about my family life, my marriage, my finances, my walk with him, my involvement in my community, how I deal with my employment, how I relate to employers, how I relate to my neighbors, to my children, to my pastor. God's got something to say to me and it's important. And I hope that you have uh, that commitment, not only to allowing God's word to speak to you, but then as you share it with others. You know, I have found over the years, and not just because I'm a preacher, but I have found that, you know, it's one thing to read God's word. It's another thing to think about the meaning of it. Um, it it's, it's, it's another to sort of process that, and it speaks to my heart. But when I take time to share what I've learned with others, it's like the final step of the learning process. And when I share what God spoke to my heart about, whether it's in preaching or just sharing it with my wife, with my family and say, hey, look what I found in the word of God. When I take that step, wow, that truth becomes real in a much deeper way than even before I just thought about it. And so let me encourage you in that way. You know, read God's word, understand it, allow God to speak to you, and then go share it with someone. I think your pastor would be blessed if, if you came to him on, on a Sunday and said, hey, pastor, I read this passage this week. This is how God spoke to my heart. He'd be blessed to hear that. Share it with your family. Share it with fellow church members. Share it with the unsaved. God wants to use that in your life and in theirs. So we have... As we continue along here, we have, we've encountered the certainty of the truths of the gospel, the things most surely believed that Luke is speaking of here, and the quality of that truth is that there is a corroborating witness to us. That, that ought to help us, because those four gospels all go together. There is a careful arrangement of it, and there is a, a continuity and a progression. There is a consistency in how it holds together. There is a correctness to it, and it is the truth. And then we, we need to understand there's a commitment on our parts to understanding that truth and uh, an exposition and declaration of that truth. But ultimately, there must be a conviction of faith, a conviction of faith. Those things that are most surely believed among us. That is, it's fully known, and we are fully persuaded to carry through to the end, to fill, uh, to, to, to move forward with conviction. The things that you live for need to be worth dying for. If it's true in the light, it's true in the darkness. If it's true on your best day, then it's also true on your worst day. And this is the type of an anchor that we need to have in, in the gospel truth today. If, if we believed it once, we should believe it always. It's not the fad or the fancy of the moment. And I'm telling you what, people are going to come along and they're going to disappoint you. Circumstances are going to puzzle you and upset you at times. And Satan is desiring to derail your faith from the day that you get saved. But if it's something that's most surely believed, if it's that which... It has certainty to it, as Luke wrote here. Then by conviction of faith, we're carrying this thing right on through to the end. Yesterday was July 3rd. 
And 44 years ago, yesterday, I trusted Jesus as my Savior. And you know, this gospel message is just as real to me today as it was 44 years ago. When I got saved, I sat in a church service and an old-time evangelist preached from Acts chapter 16, where the Philippian jailer, you recall how Paul and Silas had been in his prison cell. There was an, They were singing at midnight praises to God. An earthquake shook the place, and the prisoners would have gone free. That old jailer knew it was his life for the life of any prisoner that escaped. And he was ready to take his own life. And Paul and Silas said, don't hurt yourself. We're all here. And with that testimony, that jailer cried out, sirs, what must I do to be saved? In Acts 16, 31, their response, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. That message was preached by evangelist B.R. Lakin, July 3rd, 1977. And I don't know it to be true, but I honestly, the conviction was so strong in my heart. I believed if I did not get saved that night, I'd never have another opportunity. I was 15 years old, nearly 16 at the time. And I went forward as soon as I could. First, word of the first verse of the invitation hymn. I was down the aisle and I met with a counselor. We prayed, but you know, I believe that when I took that step of faith and obedience to step out of that aisle, that's probably when I got saved. I knew the message. I'd heard it hundreds of times, but I got saved that night. And you know what? My conviction of gospel truth has only grown over the years. I've failed the Lord Jesus many times since I've been saved, but he has never failed me and he'll never fail you. The conviction of faith in the gospel is what you and I need to build our lives upon. And I want to say to you that it is, first of all, a reasonable faith, a reasonable faith. It's not only believed, but it is believable. People believe some unbelievable things. People believe some crazy things. People believe things that are not supportable in any way, shape, or form by the facts. People believe in, in UFOs, and people believe in all kinds of crazy nonsense. But the gospel is a reasonable faith although we sadly know that not all believe. It's a reasonable faith. It should be a resolute faith. Things most surely believed. Strong convictions become the foundation in our lives for strong actions. What has enabled the martyrs to face certain death? How about the Apostle Paul? He said, as he came to the end of his life in 2 Timothy, I've, I, I have uh, fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. He said, and I'm now ready. I know the time of my departure is at hand, and I'm ready to be offered. I'm ready for it. Wow. In the face of the executioner's sword, Paul didn't flinch. Paul didn't bend. Paul didn't waver resolute faith. It's that which we read of Abraham in Romans 4.21, being fully persuaded, fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Paul said in 2 Timothy 1.12, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. I hope someone didn't just talk you into being saved. Because if people talk you into something, someone else can come along and talk you out of it. I hope you're saved because it was a heart conviction that Jesus Christ died for you, 
and that outside of him, there is no salvation. There is no other savior. A conviction like that will carry you through. It's a reasonable faith. It's a resolute faith in the heart of those who have believed. It's also a restricted faith. He said it's the things that are most surely believed among us. Sadly, not everyone believes the gospel. It's alarming in our world today. People are preaching other gospels. You know, even the vaccine has become a gospel. The COVID-19 vaccine, in a sense, has become a, a gospel on its own. And people are zealous about that. But we're talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're talking about the good news of salvation, the forgiveness of sins. But yet in Romans 10, 16, Paul says, they have not all obeyed the gospel. We'd love to be able to share the gospel with our closest friends, family members, loved ones, and see them all instantaneously believe and receive the gospel. But sadly, that's not the way it works. And many times, and it seems like most times, they reject it. Some will, some will get downright angry. Some will mock and scoff. Others will just say, you know, I'm not ready for it. Say, I like, I like what I'm hearing, but, you know, it's not for me. And they'll dismiss it. They'll be dismissive of it. And it breaks your heart, doesn't it? If you could get saved for those people, you would. But it's an individual decision. Not all obey the gospel. It's a restricted faith that we have. Jesus said that it's a narrow way, and it's a straight gate we enter. It's a broad way. It's a broad path that leads to destruction. Not everyone will be saved. And who are you? Who am I? that we've been saved by the gospel of Jesus. It doesn't make us better than the next person. It doesn't make us one bit better than anyone else. It's only by his grace that you and I have been saved. We have been called sons and daughters of God, children of the King. It's a wonderful wonderful privilege that we have. Romans 10, 16, they have not all, all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report? And though, though you're in the minority, and will always be in the minority as a believer, please understand, please realize that this is the only conviction on which to build your life. It is the only message that will make an eternal difference. My dad is 85 years old. He was born in a little country house in Yarrow, British Columbia in 1936. In fact, when I was a kid, my dad used to drive us out to Yarrow, and he'd say, there it is. There's the house I was born in. Now, the modern hospital I was born in has been torn down since and rebuilt, but that little old farmhouse, it still stands there. That's where my dad was born. My grandparents didn't have any money, so the doctor who made the house call to deliver my dad received payment in a couple of chickens. My, my grandfather raised chickens and he paid the doctor with some chickens <laughs> for delivering his son. 
My dad was born there in 1936, but it wasn't until 1978, 42 years of age. My dad was at the time living a double life. He wasn't saved, but he had learned the Christian, Christianese, we call it, the church lingo. My dad was a deacon in the Baptist church. And he was so troubled, he finally went to the pastor. And he told his pastor, look, I'm the biggest hypocrite in your church. And he said, either I've got to leave the church or I got to get saved. And I thank God for that godly pastor who said to my dad, Ray, do you want to get saved? And my dad broke down in tears, said, yes, I want to get saved. And that day in June of 1978, my dad trusted Christ as his savior. I told you before, my dad wasn't perfect. But my dad began to memorize scripture. My dad was convinced of the perfection of the gospel. It wasn't about him being perfect. It was the fact he had a perfect savior. And through the last 43 years of his life, my dad built on this foundation of gospel truth. And that's why I'm here to tell you today that whenever he graduates, it could be any moment now, any hour. We're expecting a phone call from the hosp hospice. It says, your, your, your father is no longer here. But I'm confident he'll be with the Lord. He built his life on the right foundation. And if you're not saved today, I beg of you, begin now by receiving Christ as your Savior. That's the foundation. If you are saved, fantastic. But don't sit on your laurels resting in the fact that, well, I prayed a prayer and I trusted Christ as my Savior. Go on with God. Learn the gospel, the life of Jesus. Learn more. Build on that foundation. Build your life on it. And it's a foundation that lasts. It's a foundation that you can share with your children and your grandchildren. One day you're going to you're going to die like my dad. You're not going to carry anything out with you. All the gadgetry that we have nowadays they're great tools, but we're not taking it with us. You can build up an incredible portfolio of investments. You're not taking any of that with you. Fancy houses, cars, jewelry, clothing, it all stays behind. But what about your children? What about your grandchildren? The only way you can take them with you is through the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're going to know that they're watching your life. They'll know if this is important business for you. They'll know it. And they're going to follow it. I trust I've encouraged you today. I trust I've helped you. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. And as we do, if you have a decision to make today, I don't see you where you are. I'm staring into my webcam, but God sees you. And if you're viewing this today and you've not yet trusted Jesus as your savior, I encourage you to humble your heart, just bow your heart before him today and acknowledge that you're a sinner and that you know Jesus is your only hope of salvation. And if you're a believer, say, oh God, I'm going to live in harmony with gospel truth. That's what I'm going to do. 
let me encourage you in that way and we'll pray and you can make your decision while we pray. Father, we thank you for today. Lord, you're amazing and, and so good to us and so kind to us and so gracious to us. And you give us so many opportunities, first of all, to be saved. And then you give us multiple opportunities, uh, Lord, to progress in our Christian life. We're much like the disciples. We're, we're slow learners. Father, sometimes we need to learn lessons multiple times before we get it. But Lord, we thank you for the kindness, the long suffering, the mercy that's been extended to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. And today, I am praying for every viewer here, every listener, that they will progress on the foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Whether today is the day that they get saved or whether they've been saved for many years. And so, Lord, help us all. We love you, Lord. We thank you again for this wonderful opportunity today. We know you're faithful. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I want to just close by thanking Pastor Bianchi for the opportunity again. And uh, the dear church family there at uh, Bible Baptist Church, you guys are really precious to us. We love you all. Thank you for your prayers. We're praying for you. And uh, now I'm just going to turn things back over to Brother Ray. Thank you, Pastor uh, Ryan Tyson. Um, so I think we're not alive anymore. We're, uh, Ace will just uh, <clears throat> put a special in our live. Uh, stream but uh, thank you again for for uh, that message uh, me myself was <coughs> uh, encouraged oh I guess we're still alive I see <laughs> was my soul was a stray from the head Oh, God.
Oh.